them to have the ability to maintain it with prices. So if we explain ourselves in those terms, I don't believe we're going to run into nearly as much opposition as we have in the past. And I know it's been hard for all of us not to have those argumentative reflexes. <laughs> you know, We know how hard we've worked and how many things we've tried to do. And when someone tells you that we've made mistakes or that we haven't done things the way they thought they should be done, your immediate reaction is to jump to the defense of what's been done in the past. And perhaps if we would ask them what they would like to see done in the future and who else is in a position to do something about it, you could skip over those kinds of things. And it's our job to build bridges, not to burn them. We've got two other ladies here who have some good information for us that's a little different type. Bobby Cox from Montana has a flannel board presentation that she has given many times in her area that explains what collective bargaining is all about. Now, many of us feel that we are pretty well educated in that kind of thing, but do we really know how we can present it to other people sometimes? And if you listen to other people's ideas, it'll generate some more of your own. Bobby has, um, how many years? You, you're a charter member of your county, aren't you? That was 69, 68. Uh, and I remember being out there one time last winter and Bobby and her husband were given an award by their county for having never missed one county meeting in all the years that they've been organized. Now, how about that? <laughs> and they've been active in other things other than their county. But that would give you some idea of the loyalty and dedication that, uh, that sometimes people never notice. And I'm sure that there are things that you have done and people in your county have done, but it's a total thing. Had it not been for the contributions of each and every one, every place they've been, we wouldn't be at this convention saying, all we need now is production. Bobby? Well, you saw me eating crackers, and it's because I have a nervous stomach. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to do these things, because all you have to do is find some good people and ask them to say some prayers for you. I was, I'm a fainter, and I was getting weak up there. <laughs> and I don't even know, I can't remember the lady's name next to me. But I finally, I said, do you pray for people? And she says, I do. And I said, you better pray for me or I'm going to be laying under the table. <laughs> so don't be afraid to do it, even though, uh, you know, y you think you can't. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about some things. First of all, I'll answer the lady about the nonprofit permit. We have one, and uh, if you are a new county or a new area, it's a little easier to get them. You need, uh, can you hear me? Okay. You need to uh, have a real good set of treasury books. And you really have some files to go through. We had an excellent treasurer in our county for nine years from almost the beginning. I think she was the second treasurer and then she worked for nine years. She keeps excellent records and you can take these records to the IRS. And if... Uh, if they are so inclined with a little prayer, <laughs> you can get a nonprofit permit. And uh, I got one over on Anita. Our nonprofit is 2.4. No, 4. Point, uh, wait, what are they? 2.4 is what we pay. She pays 2.7. So don't anybody tell them in Montana they're three cents behind. We like staying a little bit in the boonies. <laughs> okay, somebody else asked a question. Oh, prayer. That's. We had the same problem. We had people that used to uh, run us off. I used to call in on the radio, and I'm the fighter. Nita's got 11 kids. I only got two. <laughs> and my husband tries to settle me down. He's slightly hyper, too, and the two of us get at it. <laughs> we, we, we get quite settled, you know, get on the war side. 
but he keeps me straightened out a little bit. I'm, I'm the one, I'm the warrior. My favorite song is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> Uh, I think there's a lot of psychological values to the thing that we're doing here in the National Farmers Organization, and I want to demonstrate one to you. I carried my red sweater on. I'd like to see you wear <laughs> more war colors. <laughs> it has a psychological effect upon the people you talk to and upon yourself when you do it. And you should just keep this in mind when you go to buy your Christmas things or if you're going to buy things for your husband. You may have to go slow. My husband's one who wears quiet browns, quiet blues, quiet grays. I don't know how much quieter you can get. <laughs> I got him in a red shirt. <laughs> and I swear it changes his whole attitude and the attitude about everybody around him. It has a psychological effect. We, too, have a newsletter, but ours, uh, uh, I think we maybe cover more acreage, but we don't cover as many farmers. Ours, uh, we still kind of do by hand. I crank it out in the basement, and another lady addresses it, but we do use stickers, so she gets an address. It, too, has had one of the most powerful effects in our area, I think, of anything. We cannot get good coverage over radios and TV and over the newspaper. There's just no way. You've got to have a newsletter. And uh, we sell our ads for $15 an inch. And in Montana, it's a little hard to get very many pages because we don't have very many businesses. But it's easier to cover the farmers because I can cover all the farmers in two counties with 700. And the Fergus County that uh, is my home county is the same size as the fourth of the state of Iowa. We're not happy about it. <laughs> I mean, you know when you see the empty houses on the countryside. Okay, I'll do my flannel now. I better tell you how it came about. <laughs> I sometimes like to challenge my husband. Remember, I'm the warrior. <laughs> he kind of is too, so I like to challenge him. But he doesn't believe in ERA, and I don't either. And so every once in a while, he tries to prove it, and he wants me to do what, I, what he tells me. So he kept sending me to meetings I was uncomfortable in. I'm happy in NFO meetings. I'm comfortable in NFO meetings. We have a good time in NFO meetings. No worry. It's fun. My husband says, you go to those wife meetings, women involved in farm economics, and you want to be uncomfortable. And I get the shakes. I already told you I do this. <laughs> so I sit there. They think I'm taking notes on them. I'm writing memory verses <laughs> in order to keep myself from getting the shakes. <laughs> and it scares them to death because I know I'm NFO. So I behave myself, and I have. I behave myself real well. I said the right things, mostly nothing. <laughs> most all of the time at their meetings, and I just sat there, but I still made them nervous because I was one of those, when you guys in Wisconsin thought you'd shoot your calves, so I got on our radio station, I said, um, we ought to dig a ditch and shoot some calves, and let me tell you, this doesn't go over in Montana either. <laughs> so uh, we got that ironed out, and we now, after 10 years of example setting, are just beginning to build finally again. We have what you might call the established ones who truly understood NFO when they joined it. Then we had those that came in for the quick profit, the fast uh, battle, you know, th that sort of thing. They've dropped out, and now we're getting those back in who understand it's going to take a little time, a little effort. And uh, but anyway, we are getting those in, these, these, in the wife meeting. They do have a degree of respect. It's not all fear. <laughs> but it would, I would be so nervous because I wanted to tell them something. See, I always want to get up. I'm a little bit like Anita. I want to get up and say, listen, I have the answers. Listen to me. 
but you can't tell them to listen to you. You got to get them to say it. When they say it, you got half the battle won. You got 90% of the battle won if you can get them to say it. So I, I told this guy, I says, I'm going to, I'm going to ask him for time because women involved in farm economics, I approve of, and I like the women that belong to it. And I, I. I even though it was a nervous uh, thing for me to have to attend those, I did it, and I like those women. But I, I said I want to give them a program. They represent unity and parity, and they have a good thing to go for education. And so I, I told this gal, I said, I want to present something to them, and so I did up this flannel board. She was praying for me. And uh, uh, they froze me out. They ran out of time. Here, here we were going to have central Montana, which would have taken in a 150-acre radius around the area where we were going to do. Uh, and they ran out of time. My nose was so out of joint. Our NFO meeting was the very, that same night. This was in the afternoon, so I asked to give it there, and I did. And that's how this came about. Go to meetings you're uncomfortable in. It stimulates you. Do, I'm not kidding. I truly believe this. When you talk to people, when you are uncomfortable, it makes your adrenaline run a little better. <laughs> Normally used to thinking about, and we appreciate your sharing it with us. Now then, that they cannot discuss NFO on an intelligent, informative level where they can bounce ideas off each other and really discuss it. This is a tragedy because if if you can't discuss things in your family, then you're not going to be very strongly inclined to, um, to hold on to that belief when someone else questions it, and especially if that other person is the wife. So if you can think of ways to bring the wives into meetings, this is one of the first things that this, this department, if you want to call it that, the women's activities, was started because we need to bring more women into the active role of member. If we could get her to the commodity meetings, get her to the county meetings, get her to participate in the kinds of things where her help and her leadership and abilities can be utilized, that is our biggest responsibility, really. Now, the average farm wife is so involved in the farming operation, whether she's keeping books or keeping the household running while you have the hired men or the kids and the, uh, you know, she may be doing farm, the work too. She may be tractor driving or truck driving or helping with the milking, whatever it might be. And so really, she, the only thing she may not be informed on would be the collective bargaining program if, if the, they have a family membership. Yes? Yes, I'd like to know about something that they don't Try to relate to something that they do understand, just as you brought up. Now, collective action is used by everybody, every economic group in this country, with the exception of farmers. You had first the laboring people. Used to be you'd talk about collective bargaining. Immediately you thought of auto workers and miners like that. Then we got the blue-collar workers in other areas, then the tradesmen, and then the white-collar workers. Uh, finally, you know, into the white-collar workers, they had to protect themselves also. The professional groups didn't call it collective bargaining. They have um, the AMA, the uh, Bar Association. Uh, have you ever gone into a bank within 200 miles of each other where, the, where their interest rate is, is even a half a percent different? Uh, what about car dealers? If you got a comparable model, would there be $50 difference between dealerships, really? You know, the collective action is used by every economic segment. Farmers and ranchers are the very last people to utilize it. And so everyone, what, you know, airline workers, nurses, garbage collectors, longshoremen, you name it, the teachers, yes. Okay, uh, so everyone has to have, yeah, well you, that's right. So all we're saying is that we didn't build a power structure. We are trying to survive in a structure that is already built that way. And you cannot survive 
in that kind of a structure, with the collective actions that are used in every other segment, you have to be organized in some way in order to protect yourselves. And this is simply what we're trying to do. We're not trying to take advantage of anyone. We're trying to protect ourselves from being ad taken advantage of by other people. Yes? As I see it, there are probably only two main groups who have the ability to make consumers aware of what the truth really is, that have those resources, and that would be the industry itself that has the profits to uh, advertise the meat, and government that has taxpayers' money at their disposal. And neither of these groups uh, is it to their advantage, particularly, to make this an issue and take it to the consumer. And I would say that it's nice to have PR work. It's nice to have consumers know that we're in bad shape and that we're not getting the stuff in the middle. But supposing you could convince every consumer in the country that farmers are not getting a fair price, what could they do about it? They don't own production. They only buy the processed thing. So although we need a sort of ongoing PR in terms of um, letting them know that what we, what we are getting is not covering our expenses. Uh, there isn't much that the consumer can do. Uh, if we told consumers that we needed 1.5% uh, gross, their gross grocery bill, if we got 1.5% more, that this would be all that it would take for us to have cost of production plus a profit. Supposing they told the checkout girl, well, I want to see that the farmer is able to stay in business, take 1.5% more, you know, what would they do with it? How would it get back to you? There's no way that you can get a decent price except at the marketplace when you sell it. So although it's nice, you know, the cowbells, the wheat hearts, uh, you know, all of these are wife group. The things that they can do is an educational setup in that direction. But that is not going to affect our price. And most of the consumers, we are not concerned too much about what they get per hour when we have to buy something except to complain that it has raised the price. We didn't do anything to help blue collar workers get a wage increase. Why do we expect them to do something like that for us? You know. But why should the consumer do it? We have the production, we have it first, either we price it or we're going to go without. But is that realistic? Is that realistic? There's no reason for it. There is no economic reason for them to do it. There is no economic reason for them to help the farmer. And they have problems of, the, you know, every group has their own problems. And unless you are, and unless you can show them what's in it for them, let's put it that way, unless there's something in it for them, they don't have any inclination to take on someone else's problems. They've got enough of their own. Yes. The only solution to our price problem is to block the production so that it can be marketed in such a fashion that it reflects back what we have to have. Everything else we're talking about are the shortcuts that Bobby was talking about. A scapegoat or a shortcut, and there ain't any shortcuts. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yes, ma'am. They re there really isn't an appreciable difference in the amount of consumption if you take it over a period of more than one or two days when they may have said these are the days that we're going to boycott.
Okay, but you you didn't boycott food. You boycotted lettuce. Okay, so there's there's a difference. Uh, the products that that are going to be consumed are going to be consumed anyway. <laughs> whether they buy it a week ahead to hoard up for the days they aren't going to buy, or whether they get by at home with a substitute and then purchase it later, the next week. Yes? <clears throat> that you'll have to take to the consumer group. <laughs> Okay, to me, this would be the, the consumer group. Something like that is a problem for a consumer group. But we're talking, we're dealing with a raw product here. And we, since, since we are consumers, but we are also the only producers. And so the, as producers, we have to deal first with the producer problem. But there's no reason why we can't deal with consumer problems as a consumer. But personally, I feel that if we are getting a parity price for our product or cost of production, uh, then we will be able to keep pace with the other increases as they come along. And really, the food increases are, are much less than medical costs or gas or, you know, these kinds of things, energy costs. And what we need to be looking at are the, the total inputs over a long period of time and be able to keep pace with those as other segments of the economy do. Yes. I think you missed one point here about her lettuce. You missed one point about that lettuce. Is anybody in control of lettuce? No, ma'am. We have some Californians that probably do. Well, I'd like to know how many farmers get to pay for the lettuce he grows. Loretta, do you know? Three cents a head. Yeah. Something like that? Okay. Well, you know, the go our government puts out statistical information all the time, and this kind of stuff is available if you know what to ask for. The market basket report comes out I think monthly and you can get these bulletins from USDA and it tells you in there what the farmer gets and then it tells you what the average wholesale price is what the average retail price is and what the farm retail spread is so that you can look at that and you can see I know one time in Minnesota our state fair booth uh, this was what we used. We balanced three meals and put the farmer's share on there. And we had meat at every meal, milk at every meal. And the cost of a balanced meal, well, at that time, you know, like whether it was, uh, I think we used chicken and a pork product and a beef product. And uh, the cost on that was something like a dollar, you know, the farmer's share of what most people would figure were more three better meals than most people would normally eat. Uh, and it was very interesting to the consumers that came by, but it wasn't going to do us particularly any good as far as producers are concerned. Yes? Then you see you become the scapegoat, and everybody backs their problems off on you. I think Finkston explained this the other day. Uh, with this freeze, or ceilings, I should say, which will amount to somewhat of the same thing, everything but agricultural products were included. Now, he says this. He said you can look at that two ways. Uh, it's good if the farmer will take the opportunity to price his product and do it uh, in a relatively short time before they can do something about it. It's also bad from the standpoint that they are the only ones who have been left out of this situation and everyone who deals with that farm product is going to back his problems off on the guy who is unorganized and incapable of doing anything about it. Yes? 
this one. I would agree. In many cases, that's true. Yes. Uh, well, that's precisely what I want to say. I think in our newsletters and in our contact with other farmers and other production groups, we need to promote NFO as the structure to sell through to get the produce. And we need to publicize it for that at pork producers, cattle producers, cow sales. Yeah, it's a it's a collective action, right? And advertise them in their papers uh, and the uh, well, anyway, the, the papers that farmers yeah. read. Well, as, as Bobby mentioned a little earlier about some of these groups uh, for promotions, and I don't know, I see very few people in this country look like they really need to eat more. And she was exactly right in saying that it's, it's a substitution of one product for another at your table. You do this every meal when you're deciding what you're going to cook. About two weeks ago, uh, I was playing bridge with a group and a farm wife, who is the wife of a very large producer, said to me, oh, well, why are you going to the NFO convention? And you know, you, you <laughs> avoid religion and politics <laughs> and Well, yes, that's right. We're in a position now, I think, this year to do something that we have never been able to say completely before. We started out with an idea. We implemented it over the years with some birth pains. But this year, we have a fully capable structure and system of doing exactly what that $25 idea said it could and would do. And I do believe that if, if we can be proud of being the only group who is capable of that, we are a one-of-a-kind organization, one-of-a-kind. We are the only ones who can offer, like uh, you go on to a person's place, everybody that comes on that man's farm, that woman's farm, that family farm, will try to buy from him or sell to him, whether it's life insurance or a new barn cleaner or whatever, you know, or buy his cattle or hogs, whatever it is. And in effect, these people are really adding to the cost price squeeze because they can only buy from you within a range of what the market is already setting, you know, the proverbial 25 cents more. Uh, you know. Or they will sell to you in that range that will allow them to still make a profit. Even if a guy is a seed dealer or uh, where he's got a little commission deal to play with where he may back some off to you for a volume or something. But they're still operating within a range. So everybody that comes on a farm is going to add to that cost price squeeze except an NFO representative. An NFO member or an NFO representative is offering you the only way out. They are offering you an opportunity to put yourself above that pro cost price squeeze. And to me, there ought to be an awful lot of pride in that, in being able to do that. So it's a matter of if we've got a little deal to do with our own thinking and know that this is the right way to go. I'd like to get on with, with the next lady here, and then we'll answer questions again at that time. This is Lee Schultz. She is from uh, Scotland County, Missouri and has been quite active there, a kind of a good example to some of the other ladies, and she's been involved in quite a few uh, activities. One of the things that uh, her county did this summer, they had a farm wife barbecue picnic, family picnic, uh, honoring farm wives and invited in a goodly number. You had, what, over 100 adults there? Okay, 100 people, 200 people. 200 people, and uh, it was 
quite a good introductory kind of thing. It was a result of the uh, suggestion we sent out uh, with the blue brochures, and we'll get to that later. I'm afraid some of the county presidents didn't pass on to the gals in the county the request for uh, county coordinators and assistant coordinators and these uh, little introductory coffee meetings that we were asking people to do simply as a door opener so that we could come back and talk to them as a husband and wife team later about signing up production. Well, this was one way that they introduced this brochure into their county. And uh, she's been doing something else that's quite interesting in that area in the matter of, of pushing the NFO image as an up and coming and progressive organization. And I thought it would be interesting to you to have her tell you about it and maybe you can think of some adaptations for your own area. Lee, anything else that you want to say? Go ahead. Adaptation. And Lee has a type of communication that shows an image that we want to, people to see, to project the kind of image. And Diane Blonigan from Minnesota is the state publicity director there. And Minnesota being my home state, I always kind of like to brag a little bit, you know. Uh, they have some mass communication going there that has been kept up for a number of years. So it's something that you can do and can sustain. And I'll let Diane tell about it. I think she can uh, tell it better than I, and you can ask questions of her then. Yes, I would like to specifically today tell you about our method of getting convention news to the people back home. Now, for many years, uh, this method that I'm going to tell you about has been used in various parts of the state, and we're trying to expand it and get more people to use it. Uh, I know that in our own area, so often it happened in years past that we'd come back home after the convention and everybody who, you know, people who were friends of ours and members who hadn't gone would say, hey, what happened? You know, we just didn't hear a thing or read a thing about the convention. And so we found that the only way to get news out is to make sure that we're the ones who give that news to our radio stations and, if possible, to the newspapers. The method we use is... Again, it helps to get as many people involved in this as possible because it will make less work for each one and you'll be able to cover more territory. So what you do is you call radio stations in your county or you go visit them. That would even be a better method. And ask them if they would be interested and willing in accepting some collect phone calls from you so that you can give them a telephone report each day or as many times as they would like from you and with the convention news. And I guess the first thing I'd like to mention is make sure that when you make arrangements with a station, and they'll usually tell you, well, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning is a good time for me, or maybe they'll tell you 6.15 a.m. is a good time. And I always try and do it exactly when they would like it. I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to do a couple of them. And stick to the schedule. Make sure that you write this information down for yourself. Uh, I have a little notebook here. This year I'm doing eight stations and a network in my state of Minnesota. And I have each station down. I have their phone number down. And every one of them has agreed to call that I can call collect. And so I have that information down. And if I have to ask for a special person at the station, I put that down and I put down the time I'm supposed to call, and if I'm supposed to call, in most cases here I'm calling Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday just one time. Then after I call them, I put a little notation, Wednesday okay, Thursday okay, after the station. Because if you do a few of them, sometimes you don't quite know where you're at anymore. You forget if you called the person or not. 
to get the news itself isn't difficult at all. And I think we have a great advantage because the NFO news department does such a good job of putting out news releases. Now, they had a news release yesterday afternoon and they had one after Staley's speech last night. I'm not sure if they'll have one this afternoon or not. Generally, they have one every afternoon. And so that can at least be the basis of your news. And you can put in some information that you get on your own by going to the various meetings, too. I feel it's very important to try to attend as many things as possible so that you have a good overview of how things are going. And I'd like to back up just a little bit, too, to tell you about the reaction that I get from radio stations when I call and ask if they'd like such reports. I have yet to be refused by anyone. They are just really overjoyed to have somebody local that is going to you know, be covering a national convention for them and, and giving them this news. It's a real advantage for the station. I mean, a lot of stations spend money to send somebody down here, and this isn't costing them anything just to collect a phone call. Uh, I had one this year that I thought, gee, maybe I'm going to have an exception and somebody's going to say no because one farm director said, well, I will have to check with the manager to make sure it's okay with him. And I didn't hear from him from, for a couple of days, and I called back. The uh, farm director was out, but the manager was in, and I spoke directly to him, and I told him what I had called about, and he says, oh, yes, that sounds just great. So it's not something you're going to have to, you know, spend 15, 20 minutes trying to talk them into it because they're, they're very happy to do it. And as far as the uh, length of the report, some of them might say, well, we'd like about a minute's time. But this or no one gave me any kind of a limit. It's just, you know, whatever I have. Um, of course, you do try to keep it uh, as brief as you can. You don't want to overdo it because we know, too, that the listeners' uh, minds are going to wander a little bit if it gets too long. So hit the high points and keep it concise. Now, this is the release that was put out yesterday, and I added, I probably totally had about two pages worth here because I put in a few quotes from uh, Devon Woodlands and a little idea from Chuck Frazier's talk, too. Um, as I said before, I think it's very important, too, to have as many people as possible doing this. And I'd like to kind of reiterate what Lee said. Don't think you have to be a professional. Don't think, well, I can't do that. Because let me tell you, when I first started this, I had no idea what to do. I learned just like we learn how to do everything else in this organization by doing it. You use your head and you do the best you can, and you really learn. Um, the people, again, here the people that I have worked with are very, very nice. You know, like some of them, I've had some that will once in a while ask a question or so. Uh, maybe I should explain, too, is you probably figured out, basically what I do is I prepare some material ahead of time because I feel otherwise I'll get on the telephone and, you know, if I just have to talk off the top of my head, I'm going to do a little too much mm and ah and not getting down the basic information I should. So I think especially if you're starting out, it's important to have some guidelines there as to what you're going to talk about. And maybe the uh, announcer is going to ask you a question or two. Uh, then you supply them with the information, and if you can't or don't feel able to answer the question, just simply be honest and say you can't. But they're not out to try and trip you up. I mean, they're just out to try and find a little more information out. Uh, the uh, I'm trying to think if, I've, if I have missed anything on that part. Uh, I know I was going to mention, too, that even if you have several stations in your area, if you haven't done it before, I think it's a good idea to kind of start out, you know, with just one or two. I know the first year I did it, uh, I guess I've personally been doing this maybe either three years or possibly four because we had another gentleman in our county who really did a good job. And then because of his health and because his uh, 
kids were no longer around to do the work, he had not been able to attend conventions after that, so then I took over the job. And the first year or so, I just did a couple of stations because then you kind of get the feel of it. You, all of a sudden, you were going to you know, start out with about eight, nine stations. Uh, it probably would get, you know, you'd get a little discouraged and, and want to give up the whole thing if you just start out like that, not having had the experience before. So start out small. And I think that it's just, it's really enjoyable. And what these stations will do, I think, with just about without exception, is they will tape you. And then they will use your voice over the air. And it's really, a, it's just a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to mention just a little bit about something else that we have going for us in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area, and it touches into part of Iowa. We're fortunate in having a major radio station, WCCO, down in the Twin Cities area, which really covers a lot of territory. And as far back as I can remember, it has to be 13 years or more, I'd say, that we have on Sunday mornings had a WCCO radio program sponsored by NFO. And it used to be 15 minutes years back, and they went to a different format about five, six years ago where they are cutting their programs of informational programs of that sort to five minute segments. So now we have a five minute program and we members are the ones who do these programs. And in some cases, some Sundays we'll use one of the year's info tapes from Phil Allen. But for the most part, the guests on that program are NFO staff people and NFO members and NFO leaders in the state of Minnesota and Wisconsin and surrounding states. We have one lady who is in charge of getting the guests lined up. And then um, we do not have to go down to the station. That is again done by telephone. We have a certain afternoon of the week where WCCO calls up the person who is the guest and that person uh, does their program over the phone, it's taped and put on on Sunday mornings. And it's just fantastic because the number and the kinds of people that you reach with the program, it's just, you know, great. People who would not otherwise hear about NFO, hear about NFO. And you can, you know, like in a five minute program, you can really say a lot. Uh, when you, the friends we have who live right down in the Twin Cities area and who are not connected with farming, just about every one of them listens to it. And it wasn't even because we told them about it. it they just happened to have their radio on at that time in the morning, and they listen. And the cost of the program, I'm not positive. I think it costs us about $252 a Sunday. And counties all over the state of Minnesota, and some of them in Wisconsin, contribute to this. And we have a, a committee set up with a treasurer who gets the money in and then pays the bills. And I figured uh, it out just this um, past fall or summer, we were given information from WCCO as to the number of listeners that they have on Sunday mornings during the period in which our program is on. And using that number of people and using the amount of money we pay, it costs us about one cent for every per person that we reach. And that's really getting a lot for your money. I think that that pretty well covers what I can think of to say on these uh, subjects, but if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we're quickly going to cover uh, some material that you can read more fully after you get back to your hotel room or county. There, I, did everyone pick up a green booklet when you came in? Okay, for those who are interested in publicity, whether it be your county, your district, your state, that green publicity notebook handbook over there is an invaluable aid to you. It's been put together with the uh, help and knowledge of people who have done this for a long time, 
It's been available for a couple of years. It's the kind of thing that there really isn't much use to revise very often. The material is pretty standard. And if you have uh, an interest in publicity yourself or if you feel that your county needs a better publicity situation, then I would encourage you to take a copy of it home. There is also a loose page there that has a brief outline 